Chicago. <laughs> uh, he just, damn. You know what? I don't know about you guys, but I wish I had just like a quarter of the energy that they have. I might get something accomplished. I know they sure did. They don't need it that age. We need it our age. I tell you, man. Um, anyway, glad that you're here today. Uh, Brother John, come uh, share with us uh, what God has laid on your heart. I will let you handle the introductions and you tell us all about everything. Let me tell you about. Let me tell you about Jesus. Amen. Amen. He is incredible. He is Amen. astonishing. He is awesome. He is wonderful. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. Amen. I can face uncertain days because Christ lives. He's born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Third day, he rose from the dead, and sitting in heaven, sent the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence he's going to come and judge quick in the day, and really, really soon. You know how I learned all that? St. Blake Pastor did right here in this book. Amen. Right here in this book, he told me all of that. This is an awesome book. It is a miracle book. This book is all true. We may not understand it, but, uh, but every word in here is true. You know how I know that? Because this book was written by the one who cannot ever tell a lie. It is incredible. The most precious gift ever given to mankind is this book right here. All 600,000 words. 31,124 verses, 1,189 chapters. It's amazing. We Gideons love this book. You can tell. But I have a question for you today. The question is why? Why are Gideons so determined, so dedicated to travel all over the world giving away Bibles? What provokes them to do that? Most of the Gideons are pretty comfortable people. We're from middle-aged to elderly. I mean, I have voted in 16 presidential elections. That gives you an idea how old I am. But we can afford to get us on an airplane, go buy an airplane ticket, fly pretty much anywhere in the world. Go to a nice hotel, go out on the beach, prop our feet up, have an adult beverage. But that's not what we do. Oh, we buy the airplane ticket, all right, and travel all over the world, but we get there. We don't go to your nice hotels. No, we go to the street corners. We go to the hospitals. We go to the hotel. We go to any place where we can find somebody that needs the Word of God. Amen. But why? What pushes us to do that? Now, to answer that question, we're going to have to start at the book of Zephaniah. Now, I know all of y'all are familiar with books of Zephaniah. Pastor, I bet you preach out of it once or twice a year. I mean, yeah, the book of Zephaniah, you don't even know where it is, do you? Go to Matthew and turn left, there's three or four books in. He's one of the minor prophets. It's a very short book, though. You'll have to look closely to see it's only three chapters. I've read it a number of times. As I read through the Bible, I have to read Zephaniah, but honestly, it's kind of like the begats. It's kind of boring. I mean, what is a guy that lived 3,000 years ago? He might have been a sheep herder or a market or a farmer or something. What has he got to say to us in 2024? He doesn't know anything about us. Why would I pay any attention to him? I mean, I just read the thing simply because it's in the Word of God. But I read it recently, folks, and I like to fill out of my chair. In the chapter 1, verse 1, he tells us something. He says, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah. That is important. God spoke to Zephaniah and he wrote it down. 3,000 years ago. Now most of that book is talking about Israel. But you've got to think about it. When he wrote this book, Israel did not exist. Israel had already been conquered by the Babylonians. They had been taken into captivity. They weren't there. All of their leaders were gone. There was no Israel when he wrote this. But he wrote it as if it was because he could see the future. At least the God that was speaking to him could. Something else is kind of unusual. It really got my attention. He talks about a war going on in Gaza. How did he know about that? Israel didn't exist. Gaza sure as heck didn't exist 3,000 years ago. But he talks about the war in Gaza. And God's not happy with this war in Gaza. That's what Zephaniah tells us. Not happy with it at all. 
and God's going to respond to it as I think he already is. There was one other thing that really caught my attention. You may remember that a year ago, on October 7th, Hamas came across the border of Gaza and attacked Israeli cities. They killed over 1,200 people and took about 300 captives back in there. Some of them dead, some of them alive. It was a really bad thing. These were evil, evil people. One of the things they did, they had these little GoPro cameras on their chest and their hats, and they filmed everything they did and put it up on Facebook and YouTube and, and social media. One of the films they put on, now this one, the film has been shown, to, uh, Israel took all these and put them together and showed them to our members of Congress. In fact, you can see them, and if they haven't taken it down, it's still up there. I watched part of it, but I couldn't watch it all. It was just too bad. In this particular scene, they went into a house in Israel. Now, you, as you know, every house in Israel has a safe room. But they're there to protect them from rockets landing on their heads, not from terrorists kicking the doors in. And that's what happened here. And they kicked the doors in, and there was a family in that safe room. <clears throat> they thought they were protected, but they weren't. There was a mother, father, and three children, the youngest, a baby in arms. And they took them out and they put them in the kitchen and they tied the mother and daddy in chairs and then they butchered the two older children in front of them and made them watch. Then they took the baby and they put him in the oven and cooked him and the parents had to listen to him screaming as he died. This is evil, folks. This is true, true evil. And then they butchered the parents. And then, if you can believe it, they went to the refrigerator, they pulled out stuff to make sandwiches, they ate their sandwiches and they filmed all of that. Evil is loose in our world today. It's terrible. What is Zephaniah telling us? He's telling us two things, I believe. One of them is that God, as he told us all through the word, sees the end from the beginning. God knows what's going to happen. He knows it's going to happen, and he's ready for it, and he wants us to know he knows, and he's going to take care of it, because he has us in the palm of his hand. God Almighty loves you. He knows your name and every hair on your head. God Almighty loves you. And we've read the end of the book. Pastor's preaching on it, teaching on it right now. We win. Amen. We win in the end. But until then, it's downright scary. And I don't know about you, but I'm scared. Now, Pastor, I know over 300 times the Word says, I'm going to fear not. I've got read it. Jesus said in Matthew and in Mark, fear not. He's going to take care of it. But it's hard. He's up there. We're down here. His spirit is in me. I know that. But it's hard. I'm afraid. This evil everywhere. Have you noticed our world's going crazy? This confusion and evil out there. I mean, we got kids killing kids. I mean, we had a murder right here at Walmart in Enterprise. A guy right in front of the pharmacy. One man shot another. Death. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. And it just scares me. It really does. I mean, my wife and I, we grew up in the 50s. It was different back then. We had won two world wars and the economy was going great guns. Everything was great. Apple pie, mama, and drive your Chevrolet to the USA. It was wonderful. That's how we grew up. And some of those of you too young remember the 50s? Go home and watch Mary Tyler Moore. No, not Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, Donna Reed. And, you know, Mayberry RFD and Father Knows Best. Those old black and white shows, that's what the life was. It was what, in fact, my daddy never, ever took the keys out of his truck. Somebody asked him one time, and he said, Father, well, don't take the keys out. What if my neighbor needs to borrow it? He said, don't steal it or anything. You bring it back. I mean, that was the attitude there. The house I grew up in, if it had a lock on the door, I don't know it. I'm not even sure it was there. I know one thing. In the 18 years I was there, it was never, ever locked. It was, it was a different world. When we left our house this morning, boy, I put on the video cameras. I got motion detectors and window alarms. I got all kinds of stuff going there to protect us. My door is metal. They're going to have to drive a truck into the thing knock it down. It's got all kinds of locks on it. When we get in our car, we close the doors and all the locks go chunk. We're safe in our little shell that we cannot move through this world now. And it scares me. What do you do when you're afraid? You go to the Lord in prayer, right? So that's what I did. I said, Lord God Almighty, help. I'm, I'm afraid, Lord, help. What do I do? The world's gone crazy. 
setting the spirit of murder loose everywhere in that world. What do I do, Lord? You promised. You promised. You said you had to go away to prepare a place for us, but you would return and receive us unto yourselves that where we are, you would always be. That's where we want to be, Lord. It's with you. Please come. Please come get us. I mean, that, most people down here don't know you, Lord. The ones that know you don't like you. We used to think this was our home. Now I know my home is with you, Lord. Please, please. Because you also promised. You said when you went away, you were going to sit down beside the Father and you were going to intercede for us. And for 2,000 years, you have interceded for us. And we're so grateful for that. You've blessed us. Your grace, your mercy has been all over us. We thank you for it. We glorify thy name. But Lord, it's different now. We need you down here, Lord. Please, we need you. Because you also promised. You said that one of these days, soon and very soon, you were going to stand up and in a voice so loud it sound like a trumpet blast, you were going to say, come up here. My dog, come up here. And every single human being that has believed on your name, see John 14, 6. Every single one that's believed on your name is coming up out of the ground. And they're going to rise up with their hands up and meet you in the air in their glorified bodies. That's better than Alabama football, folks. I mean, really. That's incredible. And that's really going to happen. Everybody that's ever died, at least on him, is coming to find the ground. But it gets even better. It gets even better. Because then, those of us who remain, that past generation, those of us who remain. That's us, folks. Wrap your head around this one. Some of the people sitting in this very room right now will never taste death. For 6,000 years, you're born, you die, and then the judgment. But some of us sitting in this room will never taste death. What it says right here. It's incredible. Simply, simply incredible. In our glorified bodies. Think of that one. Folks, we move right now in three dimensions, right? Okay, four if you count the dimension of time, but we actually function in three dimensions. Even our secular scientists tell us there's at least 11 dimensions out there. And when we come up and raise our hands to meet Jesus Christ, we're going to have them all. Maybe 20, who knows? I read a story, one of these near-death experiences recently. This girl was blind from the day she was born. She never, ever saw. She had an automobile accident. In the hospital, she died on the table. When she did, she said, I came out of my body and I could see everything. She told them all kinds of stuff she couldn't possibly have known. She knew about colors. But one of the really unique things, she said, I could see in 360 degrees. Think about that. That's one of those glorious things. She could see in 360 degrees. It's going to be incredible. If you're in this room and you're not 1,000% sure you're going to heaven when you die, you're not 1,000% sure you're saved, you need to go talk to this pastor after this service because it's getting short, folks. I mean, this stuff's getting serious. It is really, really getting short. You see, America has been protected for most of our time. It's like we have this dam around us or a wall around America protecting us. That wall, that wall is this book inside. The prophet Samuel said, God, you are God Almighty. And your word, this book, your word is true. And you have nothing but good things planned for those of us who are your servants. That's us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, I don't know if that prayer helps you or not, but it helped me a whole lot. I can pray a lot, but there's something else I want you to notice about that prayer. That prayer is directly out of this book. I've read this book so many times, it's inside of me, just like he said, it really works. That prayer that I prayed came out of the 13th chapter of Hebrews, came out of the 14th chapter of the book of John, it came out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, Talking Pastor Nick Wright. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 4, came out of Titus chapter 2, came out of 2 Samuel chapter 7. That prayer is directly out of this book. You see, in the last 2,000 years, in this church age that we live in, God Almighty wants to speak to you through this book. And he's God. He can do anything he wants to. He speaks to you way he wants to, just like he did with Zephaniah. He just spoke to him. But he didn't have the book. We have the book. 600,000 words from God, directly from God Almighty to you. He wants you to read the book. If we put this book inside of us, it will change us. We know that our founders, you can say anything you want to about our founders, but one thing you've got to admit is they knew the book. In the Continental Congress, they prayed all the time and they read the book there. Most of the people, half of them were ordained ministers anyhow. But they read this book through almost every year. We can tell that because one 40% of all of our national documents were taken directly out of the Bible. It makes a tremendous difference. Especially in a time like the time we're living in. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why the Gideons travel all over the world to give away Bibles. Because it's so incredibly important to all of us. And I want you to know, in the last year, we've done real good. The Lord has blessed. All the donations you've ever given this church has been supported with Gideons for a lot of years. I wish we had a drum roll or something. Pastor, we've given away... 60, over 67 million Bibles in the last 12 months. 67 million all over the world. <clears throat> they make incredible difference. Thousands of stories. In fact, we just had a Bible blitz. Now, you don't know what a Bible blitz is probably, but what a Bible blitz is, the Gideons International, about a uh, national Tennessee, they send out this email or a text. And they say, we're going to have a Bible blitz in such a place. This time it was Mexico City. Anybody that can come, please come. We had 350 guys and women show up. 350 people. In Mexico City, at their own expense. They paid their own airfare, their own transportation, their own food, their own hotel, everything. They don't reimburse anything. Your, do your dollars go to print the Bibles if we give away. That's it. Those 350 people arrived there. There were so many, we took over a hotel and everybody kicked in extra money to buy armed security guards to protect us while there. Because you know, the cartels don't like giving away Bibles a whole lot. They're not real popular down there. We were there for eight days. In eight days, 350 Gideons gave away 600,000 Bibles that you paid to print. 600,000 in eight days. Can you imagine? The difference in that. See, get a, get in a, a Gideon Bible is kind of like throwing a rock in a pond. Have you ever done that? I know everybody has. You go out and throw a rock in a pond, you watch a ripple story, right? That's what it's like to give away a Gideon Bible. See, you buy the rock, the Bible. Then we Gideons, we get to choose the pond we're going to throw it in. This time it's Mexico City. So we went down to Mexico City and we threw the rock in the pond and the ripples went out and we go home. As soon as we give away the Bible, we go home. You've done your part. You have to print the Bible. We've done our part. We've selected the lake and threw the thing in there. Then we go home. It's up to God then. What God does with those ripples is totally up to Him. And I want to tell you about a ripple that's been going on for 80, over 80 years. 80 years. God has been using that one Bible. Back in the mid-40s, well, we Gideons like to go into schools. We go into the fifth grade class of every school you can. You used to go everywhere in America, but some of the schools won't let us in now. But we keep trying. We'll always will. But back in the 40s and 50s, every school in America let us come in. And this one Gideon, back in the uh, middle of Texas, went into a school, had three fifth grade classes, and so he went to each fifth grade class and gave out a Bible. He was leaving one class, and the teacher says, Sir, just a minute. He said, have you got one more Bible? He says, I've got a little boy named Hal, and he's not here today. Hal's out sick. Would you leave me a Bible to give to Hal? He says, certainly. So he gives her a Bible. She puts it in the desk of her drawer. He leaves. She goes on about her business. A few days later, little Hal, she's calling the road, and little Hal answers his name. Oh, well, good. Hal's well. He's back. After she calls the road, she says, Hal, would you come up here a minute? I need to talk to you. 
I don't know what he's done. He must be bad. Nobody else in the room is getting called up, just him. He goes up to the teacher, very scared. And the teacher says, Hal, I have a present for you. And he looks around, there's nobody else getting a present. You have a present for me, teacher? Yes, I have this present for you. She reaches in the desk and pulls out this book, a Gideon Bible. Now, he didn't know what it was because Hal did not come from a Christian family, so he didn't know what it was. It says New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs didn't mean anything more of him. What meant something to him was that this teacher that he adored, this teacher he thought was the most beautiful, wonderful woman in the world, cared enough about him to give him a present, and none of the kids in the rest of the class got one. Just him. He's the only one. So he took it, put it in his pocket. Now, back then, every boy's and man sure had a pocket, folks. I mean, it's not like it is now. So he put it in there, and every time Hal changed his shirt, he put the Bible in the pocket. All the way through grammar school. He never read it. He just carried it because it was special. Because his teacher, this favorite teacher, had given it to him. He graduated elementary school, went to high school, same thing. All the way through high school, he had it in his pocket. Never read it, just had it. He graduated from high school. He joined the United States Marine Corps. He's fixing to go to basic training. He goes down, and here's again, he's handing that Bible. He says, no, thank you. Got one right there. Don't need it. Thank you very much. He gets on. He serves three years. He goes to Korea. Does his three years in Korea. He comes back, one of those veteran heroes. Gets out of the service. He goes to New Orleans and trains to be a tugboat operator. The captain of the tugboat. He passes. He gets a job. He's pushing in barges up and down the Mississippi River. For about 10 years, he's doing this. Bible's still in his pocket. He hadn't read it, but it's still there. Getting kind of worn, but he's got it. I met a man just recently. Been carrying his for 64 years in his pocket. He passed recently, and they buried him with his Gideon Bible. Hal still carried his. Now, Hal's professional life was doing pretty good. He was making money, everything was good, but his personal life, not so much. Hal had been married and divorced three times. You see, Hal had a little bit of problem with drinking, and if you ever known these people, they drink a little bit, they get mean. Hal did, that's why he was married and divorced three times. He kept getting in fights, getting thrown in jail. He had a hard time. You know, a lot of us have to get all the way down there before we'll look up there. And that's where Hal was. And finally, Hal got all the way down on the floor of the wheelhouse of that tugboat one day when he finally got to the end of his rope and he reached up and pulled out his Gideon Bible. Finally, after all those years, he pulled it out to read it. And as he read it, somewhere in the book of John, Hal Lindsay accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You may have heard of that name. Hal never did anything part way. Hal quit his job as a tugboat operator. He went to Bible college and got a degree. He went back and got a master's degree. Went to work for Campus Crusade for Christ as an evangelist. And in 1970, Hal Lindsey wrote a book. You may have heard of it, The Late Great Planet Earth. It is still in print today, believe it or not, after all those years. That book sold over 30 million copies. They made it into a movie. They translated it into 50 different languages. It is still changing lives today. By the way, last year, when I shared this book, was $1.60. Today, it's $1.80. It keeps going up. In the 1940s, it was 40 cents to print this book. 40 cents. Somebody in some church, somewhere, put 40 cents in the offering plate. They bought the Gideon Bible that has changed, multiplied thousands of lives, and they won't even know it until they get to heaven and the Lord tells them. They have no idea the impact they made on this world for that one donation. Hal has written 30 more books. Hal is 96 years old today, and he's still preaching, by the way. If you'll go home and look on his channel, you will see Hal Lindsay. This week he is teaching on the book of John, and it's really good. We've listened to it. But don't you know those ripples that go out like that? They intercept other ripples. They really do. Lots of other ripples. I want to tell you about one more ripple. His name's Jimmy. Now, Jimmy was different. Jimmy grew up in the church, just like this one. When Jimmy was young, he came down the aisle, accepted Jesus, had to baptize him, everything was glorious. He didn't pay much attention to the services. He didn't listen to the preaching very much. In fact, he didn't come except when his mom and dad wanted him to. You know, one of those Christmas and Thanksgiving type guys? Grew up, went out and got himself a job, 
He was doing a very good life. He was a good guy. One thing wrong with him, he had his fire insurance, you see. He had his fire insurance. He didn't have to read this book to get his fire insurance. He accepted Jesus as his personal Savior. So he had to rapture comes or if he dies, he's going to heaven. He knows it. Everything's fine. I'll run my life, thank you very much. All the sermons went in this here and out the other. And one day, a friend of his gave him the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of him and just shook him. And he was like Hal Lindsey. He quit his job. He said, this stuff is real. Folks, what we believe is true. But this stuff is real. And he quit his job. He went to Bible school, got a degree, went back to his hometown of Amarillo, Texas, and started his own church with 10 members. Today, the name of that church is Trinity. It's in Amarillo. Look it up. It's got over 20,000 members today. In fact, they got so big, they couldn't expand anymore. So they went to the south side of Dallas and started another church named Gateway Church. And that one has over 20,000 members. Pastor, this guy preaches 40,000 people on Sunday morning. Can you imagine? In fact, go home and type Jimmy Evans into your computer and you will be inundated. He and his wife run a marriage seminar that has just changed the lives of thousands upon thousands of people alone. He's written 50 books himself. And if you, uh, he's just all over YouTube. I mean, he's just everywhere. Jimmy Evans. And all of it is because of one 40 cent donation back in the 1940s. And he's still doing it today. Those ripples are still going out, intersecting thousands and thousands of people. It's incredible how much God Almighty loves us and how hard he will work to draw us to him. And the primary way is this book right here. There's one other thing I want to share with you. This one it wasn't part of the sermon until just a few weeks ago. Because somebody asked me, how can a good God let bad things happen to good people? We just read a book about a lady and her three-year-old child got through a door. The lock was broken and she had no idea. And that three-year-old child got out and fell in the swimming pool and drowned. How can a good God let that innocent child die? And that Christian family that loves the Lord. That happened to them. Why didn't the Spirit speak to her? Why is it bad things happen to good people? Just recently, there was a police officer in New York City sitting in his car doing paperwork, and a guy walked up to the window and shot him dead. No reason at all. And that man had a wife and three children at home, three small children at home. Why does a good God let bad things happen to good people? The answer to that is God didn't do it. God created us a paradise, a perfect paradise in the Garden of Eden. And he wanted us to live there and to be fruitful and multiply, I believe he said. We know that Adam and Eve lived there for about 30 years. That's what the theologians tell us. About 30 years before Eve grabbed that apple or whatever it was off the tree and caused all this trouble. And sin entered the world. But God, but God, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. But those that love God are called according to His purposes. God will use everything that happens in your life, good or bad, to draw you and anyone around you closer to Him. To give you that story. Another veteran story since it's almost better to say. His name's Brandon. Now, Brandon had a different experience. Brandon was a PK. Boys over here know what a PK is. Preacher's kid. He grew up with a daddy that preached. You know what that means? That means you get to be there every single Sunday morning, every single Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every Bible study, and every night at the dinner table when daddy's practicing his sermon. And for Brandon, it went in this ear and out that ear. He got so sick of listening to it. Now, Brandon got saved. I mean, after all, he's a preacher's son. He had to, didn't he? So about nine years old, he walked down the aisle. Mom and Daddy were all excited. Daddy baptized him. Mama got him a Bible, put his name on it. He kept it in the room. He didn't read it, but it was there. He saved. He's got his fire insurance. He's ready to go. <clears throat> but he can make his own decisions in life. He doesn't need his daddy or some book telling him what's... It was written 2,000 years ago, for heaven's sake, telling him what he's got to do in his life. People who wrote that book don't understand me. 
And so he graduated from high school, went out and got a job, and everything was going real fine in his life. Nobody was bothering him, he wasn't bothering anybody, until they flew those airplanes into the Twin Towers in the Pentagon. And that ticked him off. They're attacking my country. Uh-uh. So he went down and joined the Marine Corps. Called his mama that afternoon and said, Mama, join the Marine Corps. She says, oh, no, you won't. He says, Mama, I'm 18 years old. You can't stop me. I signed for myself. Mama said, well, then why did you join the Marine Corps? True story, man. Why did you join the Marine Corps? Because I like the uniforms. Can you believe it? He had no idea what he was getting into. He didn't understand the word, but he didn't understand the world either. He's on the way to basic training. There's that Gideon handing out Bibles. We're always there. He's got one in his duffel bag. But you know, these things are like four leaf clovers. A lot of guys in the military like having these things in their pocket. So he took it. You take a four leaf clover. If we had time, I could tell you nine stories of where this bullet, of this Bible, this little bitty Bible, has stopped a bullet. One of them was a 7.62 armor piercing round that stopped in this book. This thing hardly stopped a BB gun. But God. But God. So Brenda took it, put it in his pocket, got him a four leaf clover, went on the basic training, did real good, went to AIT, good shot, good, good one machine gun. So when he graduated, they sent him to Fallujah. We've got a gentleman here that was in Fallujah. Thank you very much for your service. Fallujah was a bad place, folks. Fallujah was kind of like Vietnam until 68. They wanted to kill us. Those guys didn't like us very much, and they tried really hard to kill us. He was on a machine gun on an MRAP. 50 cal. That thing will cut down this building. It'll cut down trees. I've been shot at with 50 cal, but I'm telling you, it looks like a burning beer can coming at you. And those people did not like these boys that shot 50 calibers at them because they could go through the walls and kill them. So the snipers always, were always trying to get the 50 caliber machine gun. And one day, they went into an area in Fallujah, clearing it out, and one of them got him. He was firing an AK, 7.62 on the Christian round. It went through his bulletproof pass. And the Bible didn't do him good. It didn't hit it. But it went deep in his chest. His vest slowed it down enough. It didn't go all the way through. But it knocked him out of there. And he's laying down in the dirt in Fallujah. In 120 degrees weather. Dying. He's bleeding out. He knows he's dead. He hasn't got a chance. But I tell you what. We've got some medics that are really something. Did you know we have power to stop a wound? And that medic was on him in just a few minutes. Less than minutes. A matter of seconds. He was on him. Put that powder in there. Stop it. Stuck an IV in his arm. Right there laying in the dirt. They got an IV. Replacing his fluids. The blood he's losing. They put him in an APC. And they hauled him to the MASH unit. Did you know. Have y'all ever seen that show? 1950's The MASH? I know everybody has. You know we still have that. And they're still in tents. Now the tents are a little nicer now. They're air conditioned. But they had one right there in Fallujah, and they rushed him in there, and those surgeons operated on him. Within an hour, he was being operated on. They saved his life. They saved his life. Shot in the chest, and they saved his life. That afternoon, he's laying up there in the bed, look, I said, I'm, I'm alive. I'm not dead. I should have been dead. I'm not dead. I'm alive. What does it mean? About that time, his buddy came to see him. You may not know, but they call it battle buddies. When you join the service... If you can talk some of the guys in your high school class into joining, they make you battle buddies, and they will guarantee that you'll be stationed together wherever you go. And he had a battle buddy joined with him. So they had been stationed. Everywhere they went, they were together. And when his battle buddy heard that Brandon had been shot, he wanted to go see him. The sergeant led him. On the way there, he got a watermelon, because you know, when you're in 120 degrees, ain't nothing better than a couple watermelon. And he went in that hospital room and they cracked that watermelon open. They're sitting there eating the watermelon, talking about what a hero he is. He's fixing to get a purple heart, just like this one pinned on his chest. He's going home a hero. And he's going to live to face it. It's going to be wonderful. And they're all happy. Finally, his buddy goes back to the unit and he gets a good night's sleep. And the next morning, he's typing letters and all to his mom and daddy and telling him he's coming home, when he'll be home, and all that stuff. And the sergeant walked in. He's going to start. He said, Brad, I got some bad news for you, son. The battle buddy's dead. He said, when he got back to the unit yesterday afternoon, after coming and talking to you, he volunteered to take your place as a machine gun. And the sniper got him. Except he hit him right in the heart. He was dead before he hit the ground. We couldn't do anything to him. He 
kan niet eer. It's called Survivor's Guilt. It's really, really a terrible thing. I was shot down eight times in Vietnam. My last shoot down was unsurvivable. I went in a burning helicopter and pulled out two guys, but there were two more in there. I couldn't get out. They died. It was my fault. You see, I was commander. I was responsible for them. I made the decision we were going in. And I knew it was hot. And I made the decision to go. And we got shot down and they died. It was my fault. It took me 10 years to deal with that guilt. The answer's right here. Brandon was a lot smarter than me. Brandon's laying in a hospital room all by himself in the depths of depression. And he has absolutely nothing but the clothes he was wearing when he was shot. And laying in a chair beside that, in the pocket of his bloody uniform, is that Gideon Bible. That's all he's got. And he reached over and picked up that Gideon Bible. And he turned to the Psalms. And he read Psalm 91. That's a soldier song, little brother. We know that song. We love that song. Then he read Psalm 121. Then he read Psalm 40. Now Psalm 40, Psalm 40 is where David is in the pits of depression himself. And he's crying out to the Lord God Almighty. And the Holy Spirit came into that hospital room with Brandon. And as he read that psalm, the Holy Spirit took out that heart of stone that he had against him and put a heart of flesh in there. He didn't need the purple heart anymore. He had now, he had a heart for God. He gave his life to God. He was already saved. He gave his life to God. Lock, stock, and barrel. He came home. He recovered. He got married. He's got three children. He's a pastor of a church up in South Carolina now with about 300 members. And he's led lots of people to save the knowledge of Jesus Christ. All because of one of these little books. There's a thousand stories I could tell you about all this. It's one after another after another. God Almighty uses the Word of God to change people's lives. I wanted to say thank you this morning. And the best way I can think of it is to give you a gift. This is a poem. This poem was written by a mom, so we don't know who it was. We know it was written in 1891. We know that because the man that was in charge of all the railroads in England saw the poem. And he really liked it. Now they were printing a book, an instruction manual, to give to all railroad workers in England. And so he said, put this poem in that book. That's how I found about it. I saw a copy of it in one of those books. I took it, had it printed up, I changed it a little bit, kind of updated it, and it framed. And Pastor, maybe you can find a place in the church somewhere to mount it. And one of these days, when you're walking through there, stop and read this and pray over it. I think it'll touch your heart. I'd like to read it to you now. It says, The Bible is the supreme gift given to mankind. It contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of the sinners, and the happiness of the believers. It is the light to guide you, the comfort to cheer you, and the food to feed you. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. I need to repeat that one. A lot of us don't seem to realize that. Its decisions are immutable. It's going to come a time, folks. You should read it for wisdom, believe it for safety, and practice for safety, and practice it to be holy. It is the traveler's mount, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, the Christian charter. Hallelujah. Within this book, paradise is restored, heaven is open, and the gates of hell are disclosed. Christ is the great subject. Our good is its design, and the glory of God is its end. Praise you, Jesus. This book should fill your memory, rule your heart, and guide your feet. You should read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. For it is a mind of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given to you in this life will be opened at the judgment and be remembered forever. 
It involves your highest responsibility and will reward your greatest labor. It will also, listen to this one now, there's more people outside today than there is inside this building. And they need to hear this last line. It will also condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. There's too many out here in our world today that are trifling with the sacred contents of this book. It is the most precious gift, and I am fully convinced that God Almighty's first question when all of us get to heaven will be, Young lady, what did you think of my book? Brother, what did you think of my book? Wouldn't it be terrible to live 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years and have to look God Almighty in the face and say, God, I was busy down there. You know, I had to go to work, I had to go to school, I had to teach, take care. I just didn't have time to read your book, God, I'm sorry. Gosh, I don't think I'm going to be standing beside you. This is so incredibly important, folks. There is just nothing else that is as important. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much for what you do for others through the Gideon ministry. My prayer for you today is found in the 100th Psalm. When I was a boy, by his age, my mother came up to me and she said, Son, you're going to learn, you're going to memorize two psalms. Being a precocious child, I said, Why? And she said, Because the 23rd psalm is going to tell you who God is and what he'll do for you. And the 100th psalm is going to tell you who you are and what you should do for him. Make a joyful noise, all you land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people. The mere sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts, right here, with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why do we do that? Because his mercies are everlasting. And his truth, this book, his truth will endure. To all generations. In the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Jesus is Hebrew name. Yahshua HaMashiach. Jesus Christ our Savior. Our Lord. Our Master. And very soon. Our soon coming King. Amen. Amen. Amen.